Hey guys, what's up? Mad Season here, back with another video for you. As you know, Classic will be playable soon, the demo at least. I'm really excited to see how it turns out, and to sort of tide myself over, I guess, I've been reading some old articles about it. Articles from 2001, giving a first look at the game, 2004, right before launch, and even during the game. I thought it would be interesting to comment on it a bit, and make a video about it, so that's what we're doing here today. This one is from the Computer Gaming World magazine, issue 208, in November of 2001, so three whole years before the eventual release. This is quite big at the time, because it's the first actual public look into the game. What will Blizzard do next? It's a question we love to ask, those of us who've become enslaved by their addicting games. So, when Blizzard announced that they were going to reveal their next project this September, the speculation ran rampant as usual, as fanboys and industry dorks alike started guessing at the possibilities. StarCraft II? No way, they're never making that game. A massively multiplayer Diablo? This is pretty funny because that's actually the speculation for this year's BlizzCon. Personally, I don't think they're going down that route, but it's funny to see that even back when people were clamoring for StarCraft II, they were also looking for a Diablo MMO. Hey, you never know though. A first person shooter? Dang, this article is actually eerily spot on. It took them like 15 years, but hey, it happened. Well, the answer was finally revealed on September 2nd at ECTS in London, and as usual, everyone was wrong. Coming next from Blizzard is World of Warcraft, a massively multiplayer RPG set in the Warcraft universe. So, at this point, let's just take a look at Blizzard's library of games. This was published in November of 2001, like I said, so this is even before Warcraft 3. Blizzard's bigger titles at this point were of course Diablo 1 and 2, Warcraft Orcs and Humans and Warcraft 2, Starcraft and its expansion The Brood War, and Blackthorn. So, Blizzard are the kings of the isometric or eagle eye strategy slash ARPG genres at this point. The holy trinity of PC gaming. So, this leap from this bird's eye view, commanding dozens of troops, to just one character that you create yourself was quite extreme. From these linear campaigns to this giant world with 50 zones, 9 classes, 8 races, Two factions, dungeons, raids, loot, trade skills, PvP, major cities. It was enough to make people's heads spin. So hopefully, that puts this article into perspective a bit more. This was a big deal to get the first look into something so new and so massive. Little did players know though, it would take a whole three years before the actual release, so it was also a giant tease, I'm sure. It was also when we got our first look at Torrens, which were new to the universe back then. Warcraft 3 was released in 2002, so this was quite the sight to behold. This, uh, giant humanoid cow thing wearing a loincloth. What is this monstrosity? Are there female ones? What do they look like? Do they have udders? Can you milk them? This is quite ridiculous. Almost as ridiculous as... oh. Well, never mind. They go on to say how Blizzard have always been frustrated storytellers, particularly in the Warcraft universe. Most of their lore and whatnot was always packed into the manuals because they just couldn't fit it into their games. They needed a vessel with which to expand upon the world of Azeroth and all of the creatures on it. Well, necessity is the mother of invention, so they say, and thus the world of Warcraft was born. They had the world, they had the support and interest, now all they needed was the genre, and an MMORPG was a perfect fit. Like all MMORPGs, you'll start out by creating your character, either a human, orc, or a tauren at this point. 
So, the world was eagerly anticipating the announcement of night elves, dwarves, gnomes, trolls, and undead, which would eventually complete the roster of races for vanilla. Blizzard is including loads of options for character creation, including numerous facial choices, hair, horns, skin colors, and even tattoos. Armor and weaponry will be huge, of course. Obtain unique and badass items to make your character stand out, like the Sword of a Thousand Truths, as foretold by Saltzman. Whoa, check out that old interface in all of its pixelated glory. Four trinket slots? Well, that's good, because there were like four trinkets worth a damn in vanilla. Here we have the early spellbook. Here's a story for you. One of my friends had picked up the game back then, and he didn't know about the action bar. He thought that you had to have your spellbook open to cast stuff, so up until like level 30 or something, he'd be like, alright, open up with a fireball, that's a page tour in the fire tree. Oh crap, I pulled something, where's my frost nova? Phew, luckily that's a page one or for quick access. Good call by Blizzard there to have that at the ready. Here we also have a nice little preview of the new minimap feature. Whoa, now that's groundbreaking. Interesting to note that out of all of this stuff, the only thing that looks exactly the same is the cursor. As far as classes are concerned, they have nothing to reveal yet, but rest assured, they'll make sense in the Warcraft universe. So at this point, you could realistically guess some of them. EverQuest was sort of the standard for MMOs at this point, being released in 1999, and preceding that you had stuff like Dungeons and Dragons of course. So we're gonna have a warrior obviously, a ranger of some sort, you gotta have a footpad, and a mage, and so on. So people weren't that far off just using common sense. No real curveballs that strayed away from the established norm. And as the article says, Blizzard said it themselves, Look to the old manuals for clues, because that's where they packed all of the lore of their universe. Now, here's a really interesting section, I think. At this point, as I said, EverQuest was the staple MMO. World of Warcraft was directly inspired by it. It was iconic, but one thing about it was it also had a very steep learning curve. You couldn't simply just pick it up and play. You'd have to do all of this research into character classes, skill points, progressing your character, and so on. Sort of trying to explain it from an outside perspective here, because I never got the opportunity to play it unfortunately. But suffice to say, it was pretty hardcore. World of Warcraft, on the other hand, went with a different approach, and that was ease of access, straightforwardness, and appealing to casual gamers. That's right, Vanilla WoW was for the casual audience. It's a bit funny when people say that World of Warcraft is for casuals now, and it doesn't appeal to that hardcore audience like it used to. Well, they've always tried to appease that casual crowd, even from the beginning. The only thing that's changed are people's definition and expectations of the word casual. Gaming as a whole is extremely casual today. Gone are the days of renting a game at the video store, getting stuck on level 2 for 5 hours, and then giving up in a fit of rage. Every game has evolved to the point to where it's guaranteed to be beatable, or it has a mode that's beatable, such as easy, normal, or hard, or whatever, and the new hardcore games are like Dark Souls, where there's just one difficulty, and it's pretty tough. Not unbeatable by any means, but tougher than your average run-of-the-mill game with checkpoints and variable difficulty settings. The perfect example for this today is LFR mode, normal, heroic, and mythic in World of Warcraft specifically. So, back then, World of Warcraft was extremely casual. You can respect your talents, there's no stat allocating on your character creation before you even know what you're doing. In fact, there's no stat customization at all outside of gearing and talents. And this is a big one, but no XP loss on dying, or things like permanent death, which were commonplace back then. Although I didn't play EverQuest, I did play Star Wars Galaxies, which was another MMO, and even that had a much steeper learning curve than World of Warcraft. If you didn't read the manual, you were actually screwed. They gave you a short description of six different classes, 
some of which weren't even combat oriented and forced you to allocate your own stats and literally just threw you into the world to figure out what to do for yourself. There weren't even any quests for you to do. The experience was what you made of it. It was common for people to pick the dancing class and then go out into the world and try to kill something, get destroyed because surprisingly dancing isn't very effective against monsters, repeat that for a few hours, and then quit because they wanted a fun game, not a torture rack. And it wasn't even just the dancer class, even the combat classes had no tutorial at first, so it was extremely unfriendly to beginners in general, and you were expected to have done plenty of outside research to even play the game at a basic level. And yeah, I do know that Star Wars Galaxies released in June of 2003, which was two years after this article, but I'm not necessarily comparing solely Star Wars Galaxies to World of Warcraft, but just the climate of MMOs in general. SWG followed this style, and it went down that path, whereas World of Warcraft tried something new and went the beginner-friendly way. Long ago, the Orcish Horde was corrupted by the Burning Legion and lured to the world of Azeroth. For generations, the Orcs made war upon the human kingdom. So, there's this untapped market of people who didn't want to do hours of research before creating their character, or they didn't want their character to permanently die if they lag out. The casual gamer, and they ended up being the target audience of Blizzard. And they knocked it out of the park, of course, being the most prolific MMORPG of all time. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Dang, this is a read-through of old articles, and I've made it like one paragraph because I can't help but ramble. Hopefully you're not too annoyed by that. We'll get through it. So, back to the article here. We want this all to be really, really simple. We don't want you making choices about things without any information, putting points into stats and skills that you have no idea about. They said, listen, we start you off with the right stats, but you're going to have to play a bit and learn the game before we give you big decisions in customizing your character. And that's exactly what they did with talents, if you remember. You had to get to level 10 before you got your first point, which took a few hours, I want to say. At that point, you have some good bread and butter abilities for your class, and you're starting to get a good feel of what the game is about, and how to play it at a very basic level. It's not an attempt to dumb down the RPG elements of the game. It's simply a matter of creating a game that's easy to learn, but still hard to master. Wow, look at this! Here we get a cool preview of the Stranglethorn Veil Zone. I remember it having a bit more blood than this, but other than that, it looks good. Except for the tree ant. I don't remember that either. Dang, he shakes your screen when he's near you? Now that's groundbreaking. Once you create your character and enter Azeroth, it becomes clear just how serious Blizzard is. Yeah, just look at that pixelated harvest golem. I'm not too sure how the climate of the game was as far as graphics were concerned. My direct comparison was Star Wars Galaxies, but it was such a different style that it's hard to compare. I mean, the terrain looks terrible here, but that was a trade-off because the planets were so massive and open-ended. Here you can see some nice detail on stuff such as armor and weapons though. I remember for me, it was quite the shock to go from this to this. A big upgrade, but still very different. I think a better comparison would be to EverQuest, where it's a clear upgrade, so maybe that's where this article is coming from. I can see that. Putting just raw graphics aside for a moment though, they go on to talk about stuff like variety and the environments to make it really feel like a big and unique world. Again, going back to Star Wars here, these planets were huge like I said, and there were several of them, and I'd say that each one is bigger than both Kalimdor and the Eastern Kingdoms combined. Auto running on your speeder from one corner to the other would take at least half an hour as I remember, and you were going pretty fast. But again, look at the environment. The different biomes in this game were split up by planets really, instead of World of Warcraft where it's by zones. You'd be in the snowy mountains of Dunmaro, 
and right next door is the forested Lac Modan, and to the south of that is the barren Badlands, filled with NPCs who each have their roles to fill. So I know exactly what they're talking about here. What was a downgrade in size was also a huge improvement in variety and environmental detail. Once and for all proving that it's not the size that counts, it's how you use it. They go on to say that all of the NPCs have their own jobs, and they don't just stand there waiting for you, which is partly true I guess. I think for the most part, they are just sort of waiting there like zombies, but she did have some guards patrolling around, or NPCs engaging in dialogue with each other. That was another big deal back then, that persistent world. A good example with the game that broke new ground with this was the Elder Scrolls Morrowind. Whereas today, it's something that's considered standard, back then it was a major feature to have NPCs actually walking around and going about their daily lives. Just another thing to note in the evolution of not just World of Warcraft or MMOs, but just gaming in general. The illusion of this alive and sprawling world behind scripts, commands, and code. But, how do you traverse this giant world? Well, on foot at first, but higher level characters will get, what, teleport scrolls? Alright, I'm gonna have to call Bullcorn on this one too, I don't remember that. The only people who could portal around were mages, and even still, it was just to the major cities. So, if the court stenographer could increment the Bullcorn counter, that'd be great. Another interesting point here though, is how you can switch between zones without loading. Again, common today, but back then, a luxury. And vital if you're trying to make your world seem alive. That's hard to do if you have to wait through a loading screen between each zone. It makes the game seem much more segmented, which might work for single player games, but not MMOs. So, what exactly are you going to be doing in World of Warcraft? Combat obviously will play a huge role, but it'll be much more fast paced. You won't have to wait an hour to lure out one creature, and then spend 10 minutes trying to kill it. Again, another shot here at EverQuest I think. Yeah, they actually advertised that it won't take 10 minutes to kill every single enemy. That was the state of standard MMO combat back then. Carrying this beginner friendly mindset further though, Death is going to be made less painful than in the current crop of MMORPGs. You gotta be sorry when you die, but you shouldn't feel like you just got punched in the stomach and go cry for a week. I know this is a World of Warcraft video, but again, I can't help but bring up Star Wars once more. It eventually got patched, but at first, dying was horrible in this game. It wasn't as harsh as permanent death, but if you died, you left behind a corpse with all of your items on it. You had to walk back naked, on foot, since speeders weren't out yet, and find your body, and pick up your loot off it. And typically, when you died, the enemies that you killed were still there. They didn't despawn. So, you'd have situations where you were actually being corpse camped by NPCs, and you'd die 10 times just trying to get your gear back, so you could go die somewhere else probably. What a cruel punishment for something so common and with something that may not have even been your fault. Computer crashes of course happened back then, more frequently in fact I'm sure, so it was very unforgiving. So when they say that you shouldn't feel like you just got punched in the stomach when you died and go cry for a week, they weren't joking, believe me. So Blizzard wants death to matter, but they don't want to make it so you have to make a new character every time you inevitably bite the dust. Blizzard is also stressing that players will be able to gain experience from activities other than combat, such as this weird feature called quests. Hmm, I wonder how those work. You can also practice trade skills to level, which never happened, helping other players, which I guess happened if you count XP from kills, and maybe even just exploring, which ended up being true. It was a very small amount, but hey, it was there. 
Quests will range from easy solo missions that you can do in one or two hours, to large scale quests that may involve many players roaming all over the world. Boy was that true, I'll tell you what, with the Anixia Chain, or the Scepter of the Shifting Sands questline, to name just two. The game is really all about other players. Blizzard is focusing much attention on developing rewards for participating in the community and working with others. One exciting concept they're introducing is that of ritual magic, spells that require multiple casters to use. The example they demonstrated for us was a ritual spell that opens up a portal to a special zone. To do this, we needed multiple casters because different players possess different spells that all needed to be cast together. You could then travel through it and it would be barred off to non-participants, so if you're one of the few people in the world who can do certain ritual spells, everyone will know it and you'll be the most popular kid in school. Well, this is something that never happened. Unless you count the Warlock Summon. Off the top of my head, that's the only spell that required multiple people. And even then, the Warlock was the only one casting a spell. So, maybe a remnant of a failed system, which is unfortunate because it sounded pretty interesting. Classic is all about fulfilling these weird roles. Warlocks were the only ones who could CC elementals and demons with Banish and their soul stone was quite unique, which made them valuable. Druids were the only one with the battle res, mages were the CC kings, and so on. It doesn't surprise me that they also had this weird ritual spell system set up as well. I can definitely imagine certain classes who would have specialized in it, and give people more reason to keep them around. But I guess we'll never know. Oh man, look at this. Every class will come with an innate passive ability that's shared between everyone. If you're a ranger, your minimap is filled in with more detail than all of the other classes, and you confer that to any nearby groupmates. What about shamans? Do you get a water elemental to clean your underwear for you? Oh man, the blizzard no-no list. No load times between zones, the need to camp for crucial monsters, too much downtime between battles, food and drink needed to stay alive. That would be awesome if your character starved to death if you forgot to feed them after you logged off. Every time you logged into Ironforge, you'd be surrounded by a thousand corpses of people who forgot to feed their characters before quitting last night. No rats, nor rabbits to kill? I'm gonna have to sound the bullcorn alarm on this one. Rats or rabbits, maybe but I remember my fair share of boars and cute woodland creatures that would tear your throat out if you let them. Ah, oh, here we go. The earliest map that we know of of the Eastern Kingdoms. Here you can see Quoth'alas, which never saw the light of day until the Burning Crusade expansion, Tolbarad, which was missing until Cataclysm in 2012, and Kul Tiras until BFA. Grim Batal was around there somewhere, but not accessible until the Cataclysm. The Blackrock Spire is ever-present though, along with the starter areas for human. So really, only about 60% of these areas actually made it into the finished product three years later. That's what this game is all about. Mighty dudes doing great deeds, and they nailed it. This is a great screenshot because one of my most memorable moments in the game was when I first entered Ironforge. Just as how this human warrior climbed the mountain, so did I on my dwarf and I entered the capital to see players of every class talking with each other, crafting, barking, trying to sell stuff to make some gold. Coming from Star Wars, the first thing I asked was how to get the glowy weapons that looked like lightsabers, not knowing that they were just weapon enchants. While there are some inaccuracies and stuff that was never implemented, for the most part, they hit it right on the money with this article. We were promised this thriving, persistent world, with hundreds of adventures to embark on, and thousands of players to meet, and that's what we got. I hope you enjoyed the video. I did have some other articles planned, but this is starting to get out of hand, so I'll just leave it here. If you guys liked it, maybe I can make a follow-up. Not only of articles before the game's release, but after as well and just look back at how the game has evolved and how it was perceived through the early stages of its life. I think that would be fun, and it could waste some time while we count down to classic here. So let me know if you'd like to see that. 
If you want to take a peek at this preview yourself, I'll have a link in the description. I highly recommend it. It's a wild ride. Thanks for watching as always. Like the video if you liked it. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Farewell for now, mortals. We hope you enjoyed today's video. See you again soon.